I uh, made a film a, a number of years ago about uh, immigration between China and Canada when I was working at Simon Fraser University. And we delved deeply into the history of uh, Chinese Canadians and Southern Chinese uh, migration stories. And through the research, I came across a small statistic that 85,000 Chinese had been transported across Canada in World War One. And I asked around, had anybody heard of this? And, and you know, nobody had. So uh, I was intrigued by this, but I really had no idea the scope and complexity and, uh, you know, just the sheer size of the story. So, yeah, it was, it was coming, I came across it in past research and then, and then I just decided to commit to researching further. Well, thanks for bringing this story to us. That's really a staggering uh, story in Canadian history. Tell us about the Apex Food Map. Right, so uh, in, well, in Canada, as many of you may know, uh, early, early uh, history for Chinese in Canada was uh, that of, of labor uh, in the 19th century, uh, coming to Gold Mountain, working on the railway, working in mines, working uh, in the gold rush. Uh, so there was a big influx of Chinese immigrants to Canada and the U.S. and around the world um, through the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Canada was not fond of Asian immigration, to say the least, and instituted a number of head taxes, which r rose to about $500 in 1903, uh, and eventually excluded Chinese from Canada, as many of you may know, in 1923 with the uh, Legislative Immigration, uh, Chinese Immigration Act. So this was the context in which this story was taking place, uh, which made it, I think, all that more relevant uh, for Canadian history and, and for uh, us to tell the story uh, you know, from, from an international perspective. So that's, and a reenactment, that's always a slippery slope for a documentary director. Tell us about that experience. Yes, well, I mean, yeah, reenactments. <laughs> we could go on for a long time about that. I, I, would, I would say, yeah, everybody acknowledges reenactments are generally not very good. Um, so, yeah, we had our work cut out for us, and we were attempting to bring Chinese culture and, and, and collaboration into the film. So I had a huge amount of help to, you know, bring life and bring a more, I suppose, ethnographic um, approach to the reenactments where people were bringing their own flavor, their own stories, a lot of the things that you saw, the songs or the, the, the things that were said, the dialogue, the idioms. I mean, I think there's an idiom for, there's a saying for everything. It's amazing. You just you know everything seems to have the you know an incredible, profound, ancient saying. That you know if I'm sounding like I'm stereotyping, I'm sorry, but that's <laughs> what I found. Uh, so you know people would bring these idioms, they would bring their culture, they would bring their language, and and we collaborated to try to you know infuse the, the reenactments with life. And then and then of course uh, the diaries. The, the the main goal was the oral history of the descendants and the diaries. And there are like no diaries left. One of the diaries by uh, Sungan was sewn into a pillow uh, during the Cultural Revolution so that it wasn't destroyed. And it's only one of two known di like ex extant diaries uh, that, that relay the story from a Chinese perspective. So all these things combined went into the, the reenactments to try to bring some life to the scenes and, and not just reflect what was said, but we hoped that each scene would kind of have its own spark and its own life in, in extended dialogue sequences. It's a bit risky. And risky to do, period. It's industry so expensive, and yet you somehow can't keep it sort of confined and so you kind of work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it still costs money to make the film, but you know, the train cars were amazing. And, uh, Terry Ferguson, who might be here somewhere, uh, there he is. Uh, he worked with, you know, many, including Phil Borsos, who if any of you are aware of Philip Borsos, who made the Grey Fox and used these, these very same train cars and the very same train engine, which was in Kelowna. So thanks to Terry and everybody, you know, we were able to take these little set pieces and try to create a sense of life, you know, with uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Pye playing Arhu or uh, telling stories or all the life, all the stuff that would happen we would film. And so... Um, yeah, trying to contain them and yet still make them feel like there's something beyond the frame. Question for the audience. Please, you can't please. George, George, I think you should tell us about the reenactment people. You filmed the entire 
Sure, sure. Thank you. Yes. No sleep. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, the effort to make this and these set pieces is is really profound. I mean, Did you get Chinese labor? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, yes. In fact, yes. We all we all labored as Chinese laborers. Uh, so, the you know, we construct my brothers, uh, Leaf and Cole Patterson. There they are. They designed the trench, and you know, they've never worked in a film before. And you know, we all just. We all put our best effort, effort forward. So the trench, they're all, it's a very corridor film. Everything's sort of going down these corridors because everything could be contained in these little stories. So the trench or the trains or you know, these sorts of things would, would be limited and, uh, and, and sort of realistic set pieces where we didn't have to necessarily reenact battles. And, and we didn't want to reenact battles as such. You know, we wanted to focus on the intercultural story. So yes, thank you to all who helped to build these sets. We worked for weeks in the middle of the summer, and, and you know we all definitely went the distance. And please, how'd you come up with your title, Tricks on the Dead? Tricks on the Dead. Well, you know, titles are tough, but um, yeah. So the title uh, is a quote from the philosopher Voltaire, uh, who was a French philosopher and Enlightenment philosopher who. You know, by today's standards, it's probably uh, not so progressive, but of his time, he was a very progressive-minded French intellectual who really revolutionized historiography. And you know, all of these sort of post-structuralist critical theories we have on history today uh, are largely reflected in this idea of, not, he, he, his quote was simply, uh, history is nothing but a pack of tricks we play on the dead. And, and these, these laborers have been, you know, they went through all they went through, and their stories were basically lost. Their families lost them. They forgot who they were and what they meant. And they became highly politicized. It, the, the story was basically repressed in China until about, oh, maybe 2007 or 2008. And there was a, not repressed, but not favored. So it wasn't in the media. It wasn't really written by, uh, about by scholars. It was a fractured government in China at the time. So a lot of the you know, politics that get foisted on these uh, laborers are uh, recent developments. And perhaps in some ways it can seem rather in innocent because all countries do this. We all do this in our remembered ceremonies. So the hope was that the film kind of points to that, alludes to that about the idea of memory and history and that you know, it's really questionable how, how we use the dead and remember the dead and commemorate the dead in, in, in the context of war. And my congratulations on uh, the Bus Series 2 campaign. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was a, you know, an incredible uh, out, outcome. Uh, you know, we have so many amazing films showing in the Vancouver International Film Festival, and of course, we're very thankful to be here amongst these films, feature films, very, very capably done uh, productions, and that, you know, this vote that came out to all of you to pick a, a film based on a trailer but none, nevertheless, you know, to look at the, the film and, and the content and to engage the audience, uh, we fortunately won the vote. Hey. So thank you for voting, and, and uh, it, is, it is really just a, a, a wonderful opportunity to bring the story. This brings, brings the story to people's attention because there's 300 films in the festival, and it's difficult to know what's what. And this is our chance, a blessing, to have the story told, and not only have it told, but be, be brought to the public's attention. So thank you very much. So you mentioned, in your film, you mentioned the many Chinese, the even Chinese, they don't know this part of history. So will you bring this film to China? Yes, so, so yeah, the history, I mean, it is, it is a, a sort of, you know, yeah, it's, it's a story that, that you, you know, I. I I'm very pleased and happy that people found interest in, in a World War I Chinese labor story. I, I believed in it, and everyone came together to believe in it, so uh, apparently people are really responding to it. Uh, in China, it will, it will show across China on CCTV in the coming months. I'm not sure when. It's a bit complicated. But uh, yeah, it'll show to the entire country. So it's been divided into four episodes. We're the first Canadian company to collaborate with CCTV 10. It was, uh, you know, all those beautiful images that you saw, saw at the start of the film. I mean, we, we make, we're so fortunate. Those villagers live in those villages. They're the same villages out that the laborers came from uh, in that area. Uh, Ying Wong and, and so many others. I'm, 
there's too many names to mention, but Ying was a crucial uh, person who came with me and Norm Lee, just the three of us and an entire crew of 15 people who only spoke Chinese. So, so I, wo shu wo zhong wen han hao. Wo yao jing tiao gar, wo yao san jiao jia, wo yao gui dao, ta men gei wo mei wen ti. <laughs> so I learned a lot of a lot of Mandarin on set Mandarin, and, uh, and and it was an incredible experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Patterson.